Tis I, the petticoated swashbuckler. My name is Marin, and today we will be engaged in cloak and d bonnet stuff. Sorry, it's the best I could do on short notice, pun wise. currently in the process of recreating the inventory of an 18th century uh, English woman named uh, Mrs. Anne Bamford who lived... well she died sometime around 1780 um, and she there was made a massive inventory of uh, her wearing apparel and other items after her death and uh, it's more than 200 items it's massive and I'm, I'm slowly but steadily recreating this and uh, well it's winter now um, it's beautiful in Norway it's very snowy and cold and gorgeous so I thought I want to make some outerwear and hopefully the inventory includes quite a lot of cloaks see if I can remember them all there is a there's a green satin cloak, there's a black satin cloak, there's a black gauze cloak and there's a chagrin silk cloak which I was, I should, I thought chagrin was some kind of leather but I might be wrong yeah I'll have, I'll have to look that up um, and there's four, at least four white silk cloaks why did she need four white silk? do you Mrs Bamford, you do you um, so I thought, make a cloak. Cloaks are fun, cloaks are great. Uh, so I'm gonna try and make the green satin cloak. And I have got, I was looking around to see, you know, inspiration for cloaks. I do have this lovely book, Costume Close Up, Clothing, Construction and Pattern from 1750 to 1790. So perfect. And it ha does include a pattern for a cloak, if I can find it. Mm, yeah. uh, and this cloak is from, I mean, everything in this book is from the Colonial Williamsburg collection. However, this cloak is probably from England, according to this book. Uh, the original was made from a red broadcloth wool, uh, but I thought I'll make it from, a, from green satin. I, I've never made a cloak before and it doesn't really, I, I don't really have like a pattern to, well that's not true, I made a medieval cloak but not, not an 18th century cloak. Um, it's not really like a pattern, it's not even gridded, it's more like shapes in a diagram kind of thing. So I thought in case it turns out shit, I'm not going to spend like loads of money on silk satin. So I've ordered some nice green cotton satin. Um, from the US, I'm hoping it'll be here soon. Um, and yeah, I think that's going to be quite nice. I mean, the original, the cloak, the, the hood was lined and the cloak was faced in front. Um, I think I'm going to line mine completely because I've got some really nice cotton with a nice print on it that will work beautifully. I have seen cloaks that are fully lined. Um, at least Norwegian cloaks. I'm pretty sure I've seen English cloaks as well. Anyway, Nor Norway got a lot of its impulses, fashion impulses, from from England in the 18th century. So chances are, if there are fully lined cloaks in Norway, there were fully lined cloaks in England. So I'm going to do that. It's very nice. It's a big sort of semi-circular cloak with uh, slits for your hands. Um, it's got a big hood. Yeah, it's very nice. Looking forward to that. I'm also going to make a bonnet because the inventory includes one black velvet bonnet. Now the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Beauty includes a bonnet pattern. Uh, now the bonnet in this book is very big, like it's, it's made to sit on one of those very big hairstyles of the 1780s 
I'm probably going to be wearing my bonnet with smaller hairstyles, so I might scale it down a bit, make it a little, little smaller, but we'll see. And it's going to be black velvet. I've ordered some black silk velvets, it's going to look very gorgeous and yeah, very, very nice. Ha! So, that's my plan. One satin cloak and one velvet bonnet. Want to come along? Starting with the bonnet, I cut out the pattern for the brim, the call, the puffs and the bow that is to decorate it. Uh, and I started off by making the brim. I cut it out of pasteboard and as you can see I only cut half the brim. Um, I realized I didn't really need the whole thing because it's the same on both sides. Having drawn around it, I cut it out. Now there's no secret that cardboard and water is a bad combination, so to make it more waterproof I got some spray-on paint. And the result is a black and a waterproof pasteboard brim. The brim done, I cut out the brim, the puffs, the bow and the coil from my silk velvet, as well as a coil shape from a silk organza, just to give it a bit more shape, a bit more body. I then went on and I basted the silk organza uh, to the uh, velvet and uh, sewed it together so that it's now one piece. The bonnet's gonna need uh, a drawstring uh, in the neck and I made that the same way I made the drawstring for the two caps in my last video so if you want a more sort of thorough step-by-step -step, you can go and look at that but I make a hole, I gently widen it and I whip around to keep it open. I then uh, attach a ribbon to both sides and with those in place, I push the ribbon through the uh, little eyelet hole that we just made. The ribbon is then pulled through and uh, we're ready to make the drawstring casing. Now, it turns out black velvet really, it just devours light so it becomes increasingly difficult to see what I'm doing but I just fold the the hem up over the ribbon um, and hem stitch that in place and uh, the result is a drawstring casing that and uh, just to make sure that I can still sort of that I haven't sewn uh, my my ribbon to any any part of the drawstring casing I just try and sort of tug on it uh, I then cut my ribbon open and I, I make lots of little tiny dags um, or zigzags just with my little scissor that seems to be in a thing that was done to ribbon uh, in the 18th century and of course it uh, it stops the ribbon from fraying and it looks very pretty and with the drawstring casing done uh, it's time to move on to the brim I cut two brim shapes from the velvet and I've just sewn them together along what will be the sort of outer edge of my brim, uh, the one facing forward away from my head. Uh, I've just sewn that together with um, some back stitches. And uh, now the trick is to place the pasteboard brim inside the fabric brim. Um, and that was a little bit fiddly, uh, mostly because I wanted both the seam allowances in the front on one side so that I could sort of hide that underneath the brim. 
uh, and avoid a very bulky line uh, on the top of my head, framing my face. Happy with where my cardboard uh, room is, I uh, pinned the open edge shut. I pinned very close to the, the cardboard or the pasteboard uh, just to keep that in place and you can see I'm just I'm sort of wriggling it and manipulating it and making sure I have the seam allowances where I want them all the time. Then again using back stitches I sewed that and shut just very very close to the pasteboard but I, I really try to avoid actually sewing through uh, the pasteboard uh, so I'm just sewing through the two layers of fabric but along the edge of the pasteboard and I used a very strong black silk thread to do this I mean, again, the fact that this is black velvet makes it almost impossible uh, to see what I'm doing, uh, to film this in any way, uh, sort of useful to anyone. But I, after having sewn the, the, uh, the pasteboard into the velvet, I folded the seam allowance under to what will become the underside. No, sorry, the, over, the upper, the, the, the top side of my brim, because it will be covered with my call later, so it doesn't have to be uh, very pretty uh, or very neat at all and I then went in and I just stitched uh, that uh, folded over seam allowance to the brim and with that the brim is done uh, as you can see, well, maybe see, again, it's velvet, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly flexible. Um, I really like the shape, the shape is good, and uh, it looks nice with all the seam allowances on the right side. I now had to uh, attach the call um, to the brim. Now, the call is, of course, way too big for the brim, it needs to be pleated down. Uh, so the first thing I did was I used my pattern to mark where the call will meet the brim because it's not edge to edge as you can see there's like a diagonal line from a couple of centimeters up from uh, the edge of the call and sort of down to the edge that's where the call will meet the brim and then I just laid my call on top of, of the brim pinned it just temporarily in place just to keep it there and then started fiddling with my my pleats trying to get a big nice looking box pleat in the front and then knife pleating away from the sort of middle, the top of the brim, down to the sides of the call. When I was happy with my pleats, I pinned my call to my brim, where the two are supposed to meet. And uh, this is of course where it starts to get fiddly, because to fit your pleated call to the brim, you actually have to start shaping the brim, bending it. Uh, which makes it very difficult to keep your work sort of lying steadily on the table. I, I do want to apologize for the terrible lighting in this video, or at least this part of the video. It's because the the call, uh, the velvet of the call is really like wrecking havoc with my poor camera. Uh, I then went in and stitched the call to the brim using a curved needle. Uh, I found that's that a lot easier to work with uh, at this point because you don't have to actually, um, it doesn't have to be pretty, it can be quite big stitches because you're going to cover it with uh, the poofs anyway. And here are the poofs. Uh, it's just a long piece of uh, velvet that I've hemmed uh, and uh, at regular intervals along the, the strip I make some uh, running stitches uh, which I gather up and uh, tie off and it makes very nice, very very pretty little poofy decorative trim. And uh, this is to cover the ugly stitching where the coil meets the brim and, uh, and uh, give it some more volume in the front because uh, we like volume in the 18th century. 
Uh, the the bow I I've also hemmed, and I just sort of loosely shape it like a bow, uh, and then tie it off with a black silk thread just so it looks bowish, ish. I think in retrospect, I would have wanted to uh, cut my bow piece a little longer so that I could actually tie a proper bow. Uh, but I mean, this works, and it gives me some some threads to sort of attach it to the uh, to the the uh, the bonnet with. But yeah, I'm not I'm not super happy with my bow solution. I I might redo it at some point in the future. Uh, and of course the the bow, uh, the loose sort of ribbon ends are uh, given the same uh, zigzag treatment as the ribbon at the back of the call, at the neck of the call. And with that, uh, my trim can go onto my bonnet. Uh, I attached the poof first, uh, making sure it was even, evenly spaced, um, and uh, looks nice. And then I attached the bow in the front, and with that, the bonnet is done, and we can move on to the cloak. I debated with myself how much piecing I wanted to do with my cloak, because the fabric that arrived is actually quite wide, it's quite nice. But I decided to piece it at least in the sides, uh, even though that made for a lot of extra work for myself. So I I cut up my fabric. I've got this. Um, it's the beautiful sort of cotton satin, green cotton satin. And then for the lining, I got some very nice printed cotton because I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of garments, 18th century garments, for example, cloaks that are lined with. Um, printed cotton and very often it looks a bit like the scraps from someone's dress and these are incidentally my scraps from a dress I've made a Regency gown that I made they're actually from Ikea <laughs> and Ikea actually uses a lot of um, museum textiles when they uh, produce their own uh, designs they have a lot of the uh, they go through like archives in Sweden and they look up nice designs and then make use of them. So this one is a sort of greyish, blackish flower pattern. It's quite nice, quite nice. I've made, I've actually done a lot of sewing already, um, but only the sort of boring bit where I'm edging things. So this is, I don't know if you can see, but it's like one, it's one side basically, so you can see the curved edge that's going to be the cloak sort of curving um, yeah the edge sort of curving um, around the body um, and I've just I've basically just placed the I, I basted down the seam allowances and then I placed all the edges Toward it, towards each other and I basted them together with the the fashion fabric poking out you know beyond the edge of the lining fabric and then I did a sort of prick whip stitch combination that I have learned from people who do um, who make a reproduction clothing 18th century Norwegian reproduction clothing. So I think it should be right for the period. It also gives a very sort of sturdy and nice um, edge. And it's quite pretty. You can see all the little, little, yeah, little pinpricks there. So I've done that to both of the sides of my, both the curved sides. Um, I've done it to the hood. I also sewed the hood together. There was a lot of piecing on this hood. 
in the original. I didn't actually need to piece it that much and I thought I won't, I won't spend an awful lot of time piecing something I don't need to piece but I did have to piece it in the middle so that I've done that. And, um, and then just edged it all around and then I did it for the body part as well including the arm slits and this is where this method this stitching really uh, got very very useful because I basically just cut a slit and then I cut um, some some slits out into the corners just diagonally folded that little sort of point uh, inwards and if you can see I just oh sorry um focus thank you I've just whip stitched that to keep it from fraying but these stitches because they also sort of go over the edge of the lining they help prevent the fraying which is brilliant so the cloak is now edged hemmed all over uh which is nice because that means I don't have to do that when I'm done with it because it's such I'm, I mean, I'm basing this a little bit off of conjuncture, but most sewing in ye olden days was what you could call piecework, which means that um, a milliner's or a um, uh, uh, mantua maker or a tailor or a dressmaker would be given, you know, given a job and they would probably then split the job up between the people of the workshop. So the people who were really good at cutting would do the cutting. Usually I think uh, the, the sort of the oldest and most experienced person would do the cutting. The apprentice probably would be given all the boring tasks of like folding in the seam allowances and basting them and maybe the hemming you know, all the, yeah, all the really boring things and the better you were the most, more advanced the, your jobs were. Now, I'm just one person, so in one way it makes little sense for me to divide my work up piecemeal, but I find it really motivating to do it because I find um, that if I can focus on like finishing one little bit and then move on to the next and then finally put all those bits together it just makes for a light journey especially with a big project now this is not a very big project but even so with all this hemming the fact that I can do most of it while I still have like three separate four actually separate pieces and then I can do the whole sort of sewing together has just made it more easy and more motivating and easier to sort of keep going because, I don't know, hemming is not my favourite. Is it anyone's favourite? It's okay, it's just a bit boring. Anyway, so what I am going to do now, because the only parts that I have not hemmed is where the main sort of body of my cloak meets the side pieces. So what I think I'm going to do is put those pieces together, just piece the cloak together basically, and then first sew the, the fashion fabric together and then sew the lining together so that they aren't combined. I, I, I debated with myself whether to do an English uh, seam where you sort of stitch the lining, I don't know if I have any pieces I can show you with, but where you, um, where you stitch both, I use it on the Italian gown um, if you want it in a bit more detail, but where you stitch both the fashion fabrics and both the linings together in one go. But I don't think that was used for cloaks, that's more of a structure seam and you don't need that much structure in the side seams of a cloak. So I'm going to use a whip stitch, I think, and then a Dutch stitch. I'll show you uh, what I mean by that. And then, but before I do that, I think I'm going to finish... God, I have so many pieces now. It's my, my table is a mess. Um, I had them all very neatly folded and then I unfolded it for 
y'all and now nothing works and I'm miserable not really I'm just confused are you my hood you're my hood I found it um it was not what's up in my in the hood it was like more like where is the hood um now this is the hood shape uh, this is where my face is supposed to be this is where my the back of my head is supposed to be so what I'm thinking is I will do and this bit is going to be pleated and then the back seam is sewn together so I think actually I'm going to finish the hood first so that it's just ready to be sewn onto the cloak then I'm going to do the side seams and then we are going to move on to the neckline and the hood. I think that's it. Yeah. The pleating of the hood is beautiful, but it was fairly fiddly to to work out uh, because it, or not to work out even, but just to sort of keep the pleats in place where I want them because the fabric uh, gets so thick so quickly. I mean, it's double. It's cotton satin and the printed cotton and then you can see it's quite a lot of folds on top of each other quite a lot of pleats uh, but it looks really nice I do like this pleated detail in the hood uh, and I used the picture of the back of the hood quite quite sort of actively as a reference when I was working with these pleats and uh, after having after I was sort of happy with my pleats I, I ended up basting them down a little bit uh, I pinned the rest of the back of the hood just to give get an idea of how it would look and uh, this is it as you can see it's a very nice sort of fan shape at the back uh, which hopefully will still be there once everything's actually stitched in place and not just basted and pinned Using a big strong needle and uh, some fairly strong thread, I started just uh, whip stitching uh, the pleats in the back. As you can see, I needed, I even needed help pulling the, pit, the, the needle out and uh, I actually broke one needle. Uh, the eye just, just died because of the force I needed to pull it through the, the back through the pleats but once they are done uh, they look wonderful from the outside I mean that fan shape is just gorgeous uh, in that shiny green satin and with the hood down I uh, started attaching the sides of the cloak to the main body of the cloak using tiny tiny whip stitches as you can see uh, just closing just attaching the two sort of edges of uh, where the, the seam allowance has been folded back uh, and this makes for a very strong seam and especially when it's accompanied by another kind of seam in the uh, in the, the lining and if you pull on it if you press it it actually also gives you a fairly flat seam I then went in and I Dutch stitched uh, the lining in place whereas where you you can see I'm just pushing my needle through the edge of this where the seam allowance been uh, folded under and up uh, on one side and then like a herringbone pattern and I've also heard this stitch called herringbone stitch uh, you do the same to the other side and this makes for a very nice very flat uh, join uh, and it's a lot easier to do when you're not holding it up to camera. It goes a lot quicker when you don't have to, you know, worry about the camera seeing what you're doing. The hood finished and the side seams finished. It's time to attach the hood to the uh, cloak. And uh, I, I had on purpose not attached the um, or hemmed the, the top of the cloak. So I'm just attaching the hood to the fashion fabric and then I'll cover it with uh, the lining when I'm done. 
And I started by just pinning the, the hood to the top of the cloak where it's supposed to lay flat against each other. Uh, there is a gathered piece at the back of the cloak where the cloak is gathered to fit the hood. Uh, but it doesn't start until quite a bit back. Uh, when I reached that point, I just I used some strong basing thread and just gathered up my my gathers and made sure they looked nice before pinning them in place. I then attached the hood to the cloak using tiny, tiny hem stitches. They're almost applique stitches. They're very, very small. You can barely see them uh, from the right side of the cloak. And of course, from the inside, it'll all be covered with the lining afterwards, so it doesn't matter. After I'd covered that uh, join with my lining, I went in and I attached some ribbons at the neck to close the cloak. And with that, it is done! even though I think it was originally for someone who's shorter than me so that the arm slits are a bit high, but that doesn't matter so much. Um, as to the bonnet, it's a bit small actually. I, I wouldn't have expected it to be, but I wish I'd made the brim bigger. It feels a little small compared to the illustrations I've seen from the 18th century. Uh, and of course it is terribly difficult to shoot because it is just, it's like a black hole. It took me 15 and a half hours to make, uh, and I spent 830 Norwegian kroner on it. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that would be in dollars or, um, or pounds, but you can check that out for yourself. The cloak took a whopping 52 hours to sew, it's all that hemming, uh, and I spent 590 Norwegian kroner on it. Uh, and I am very happy to take my new outerwear out into the world. So until next time, take care and uh, bye!